Welcome to Sunday 17 of our COVID-19 sequester. We're so happy that you have been tuning in to these services. We hope they've been encouraging to you. And uh, by this time, we'd hope that we would be gathering together uh, on Sunday mornings for a more regular in-person worship. But the elders, as you know, have determined to extend phase two of our plan through the month of July. From the beginning, we knew that reopening would have to be contingent on conditions, and uh, we have assessed that the conditions are not quite right yet for us to move to phase three. But we'll continue to monitor conditions to determine when that time might be best. So please continue to pray, and we will continue to record the service for your convenience to view on the Lord's Day. And we're grateful to those of you who are with us to uh, attend the recording of this service. We're sorry that there is no congregational singing, but we pray that you will sing along in your hearts with our song leaders today. Uh, just a reminder that immediately following the service, please exit through the rear door, um, and we are grateful that you are here today. Dr. Sachs begins his four Sunday series on the servant passages uh, of Isaiah today, so please zoom in at 9.30 for that class. And thanks to all of you who have been logging on to the live Zoom prayer meetings on Wednesdays at 6.30. They've been a great time of fellowship, but also a great time to keep up with the things the Lord's doing and the areas in which we need the Lord's help and assistance. And there will be no youth meeting tonight due to the uh, holiday weekend. Children's Corner, please tune in on Thursday evening at 6.30, led by Nathan Titus once again. And should you need help, please contact one of your elders. Uh, Barb and I will be uh, out of town uh, this week, so please contact uh, one of your elders or one of your shepherds if you need assistance. I want to thank uh, Doug Weimer and Claire and Charlene Lehman for the Ministry of Music, to Nathan Titus for assisting, and also to Taylor Martin, who is assisting today. Please hear this call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. Yes, 
goodness nourish us in peace. Refresh thy people on their toilsome way. Lead us from night to never-ending day. Let's pray. O oh, Father in heaven, our majestic God, three in one, thank you for this opportunity now to worship you. Apart from your grace, Lord, our sin would deserve death and it would deserve your wrath. But all praise and honor and glory to you who are able to bring good out of evil. Father, we thank you that from your throne you hear our prayers and that you give us to your son, Jesus. And Jesus, thank you that you receive our petitions and bring them to your Father on our behalf and that you have come to take us as your bride. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for supplying the words and giving us a heart to worship. We pray, Father, um, that by your Spirit and your word you take the stubborn heart and that you make it willing and ready to worship you. We pray that you inflame our hearts and give us a burning affection for your son Jesus because of what he has done for us. May our worship now be appropriate and pleasing to you. Help us in this. We know you are faithful because of your great covenantal love for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today we continue our Summer Spiritual Heritage Series on Joseph, a man for all seasons. Last time we saw the sad narrative of Joseph's brothers selling him to Ishmaelite traders on their way to Egypt. Now why did they do this? Because they were jealous of their brother, they were jealous of their father's affection for him, and they hated his dreams. The last thing we read was at the end of chapter 37. Joseph was sold to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. In fact, he was a captain of the guard. Having concluded chapter 37, we now come to chapter 38. And this chapter is a parenthesis in Joseph's story, which will continue next week. And today we come to what I call a most unusual story. And uh, it's introduced by the first verse that says, at about this time... And this means that shortly after Joseph was sold into slavery, that uh, these events occurred. Now, did you ever wonder why some things are in the Bible? Why in the world is this story here? That's a question that immediately comes to mind if you read this chapter. And it's uh, an account of some of the shocking events that happened in the life of Jacob's son, Judah. To be honest with you, you can say that this is definitely PG-13, so please take this into account, you parents with small children. This might actually be a chapter that some people will skip over. In fact, as I've re-examined some resources recently, I've seen that there are some, even expositors, who ch skip over chapter 38. 
but we are committed to doing verse-by-verse verse exposition of the Scriptures. All Scriptures, not some Scripture, not most Scripture, all Scripture is inspired by God, and there's a reason that this is here, which we hope you will see by the time we conclude today. And as always, during this series, we're going to be uh, walking with you verse by verse. Instead of reading the entire chapter, we'll walk with you uh, verse by verse. But let's pray as we begin. Almighty God, we are grateful for your remarkable love for us, a love that is beyond our imagination. And uh, we are also in awe of your remarkable wisdom and sovereignty. And we pray that as we examine this text today, that you would give us wisdom that we would see uh, why it's here and what its meaning is for each of us today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Joseph is in Egypt. Canaan is still the home of Jacob's family, surrounded by the Canaanites. Now, the Canaanites were bad. And if they weren't bad, they would do until the bad people came along. But the story moves to Judah, and the last we saw of Judah, Judah was the instigator behind selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites, so he's got a strike against him already, but now we have another strike against him. It happened, like at verse 1, at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Er. She conceived again and bore a son, she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Shazib when she bore him. Now, the strike two here is that Judah marries a Canaanite woman, which was not supposed to happen. God always warned His people that it's unwise to marry outside of the faith, lest they be persuaded to leave the worship of the true God to worship false gods. And the same principle applies today. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, we read, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Believers are to marry believers. Now, Kathy Keller, the wife of Tim Keller, pastor, former pastor, Redeemer, PCA in New York City, Kathy wrote a very helpful article entitled Unequally Yoked. And she makes three important observations that I think apply here. First, in order to be more in sync with your spouse, the Christian will have to push Christ to the margins of his or her life. This may not involve actually repudiating the faith, but in matters such as devotional life, hospitality to believers, small group meetings, emergency hosting of people in need, missionary support, tithing, raising children in the faith, fellowship with other believers, those things will have to be minimized or avoided in order to preserve peace in the home. So the believer is marginalized. But the second point is that the unbeliever is marginalized. She writes, alternatively, if the believer in the marriage holds on to a robust Christian life and practice, the non-believing spouse will have to be marginalized. If he or she can't understand the point of Bible study and prayer or mission trips or hospitality, then he or she can't or won't participate alongside of the believing spouse in those activities. The deep unity and oneness of marriage cannot flourish when one partner cannot fully participate in the other person's most important commitments. And the third point she makes is, so either the marriage experiences stress and breaks up, or it experiences stress and stays together, achieving some kind of truce that involves one spouse or the other capitulating in some areas, but which leaves both parties feeling lonely and unhappy. The principle applies today, and recently in my devotional reading, I was reminded about Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. And uh, yet he was drawn away from following the Lord by his unbelieving wives. So Judah is very unwise in marrying a Canaanite. But they have three sons, we're told. Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And these individuals were not exactly the picture of integrity. 
If you look at verse 6, Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Now, it's very unusual in the Scriptures that we read that kind of direct and immediate judgment. He must have been a very bad guy. We don't know what he did exactly, but Donald Gray Barnhouse commented that Doubtless, he probably committed some horrible perversion, not mentionable even in a book that has few holds barred. Now, certainly what Er did was bad, but we have to remember, what does sin deserve? What does any sin deserve? The wages of sin is death. And uh, if we think for a moment that any transgression of God's law is going to not deserve that penalty, then we are in error. It's only through the mercy of God that any of us have life. God would be perfectly justified in striking any of us down in any minute. So, Er married Tamar, and Er died. Now, in verse 8, we're introduced to an important biblical principle. Uh, It's a principle that has come to be known as leveret marriage. It's a principle that says when the uh, brother dies without a child, that his brother should take the first man's wife and bring children about. I'll explain why that is the case. And so we see this is what's going on um, in um, verse 8. Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her to raise up offspring for your brother. Now, this was a principle and practice of the day, though it wasn't codified as biblical law until Deuteronomy 25. The idea is that when a man died, his brother was to marry the widow and raise up offspring, if there had been none, to be the heir of the brother's estate. The child born to the living brother and the dead brother's widow would be counted as the dead brother's child and would receive his inheritance and continue his name. This law is called the law of leveret marriage from the Latin levier, which means husband's brother. And if you recall, this is the principle behind the Sadducees' challenge to Jesus in Matthew 22 and Mark 12. They were the theological skeptics of the day. They didn't believe in the resurrection, and so they put a a challenge to Jesus, and it was based on this law of leveret marriage. They took the example to the extreme by proposing a hypothetical situation in which a woman's husband dies, and she is given to his brother, and that he dies, and so on and so on, until she works her way through all seven brothers without an heir, and then the woman dies. The Sadducees ask in their how many angels can dance on the head of a pin kind of question, was if there is a resurrection, whose wife will she be? The first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, or the seventh one? Jesus rebukes them and says, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So there we see the example of the, the leveret marriage carrying through. And by the way, this is one of those, in case you're worried, this is one of those civil laws that was connected with Israel's occupation of the land and the importance of the inheritance in the land. And it has since been abrogated together with other civil and ceremonial laws since the coming of our Savior, whose kingdom is now not of this world nor linked to a civil geographical entity. And uh, we are now citizens whose inheritance is in heaven. And so, Tamar is given to Onan, but Onan didn't do his duty. Look at verses 9 and 10. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Well, we're really not able to explain Onan's actions other than that he may have hoped to get his brother's inheritance for himself. But once again, as you see, the Lord's uh, judgment is direct and immediate. Now, there's another brother. There's one brother left, but he's very young. We're not exactly sure how how young he is, but he's not marrying age yet. But Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, verse 11, remain in your widow, in your, a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. So that's what he said to her. So he's sending her back to her father's house, but here's what he's thinking. 
He feared that he would die. So he thinks that Tamar is a bad luck charm, and of the first two sons die, that he was going to die as well. So it's pretty clear that he had no intention of giving this third and youngest son to Tamar. In any case, you'd have to wait until he grew up, until there was Marian age. So she went back to her father's house. Now in verse 12, we read, in the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. Uh, when Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shears, he and his friend Hira, the Adolamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Anayim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. Tamar is now taking things into her own hands. She had come to the conclusion that Shelah was not going to be given to her. Why would she have resorted to this? A biblical historian, Leo Wood, writes, The Hittite law may be reflected in Tamar's actions, for it held that when no other brother-in-law existed to perform the leveret duty, the father-in-law is responsible. Well, that's, that's Hittite law. That's not biblical law. And uh, certainly not through this kind of deceit. And it was not appropriate for her to take matters into her own hands in this way. And so the stage is set. And you know, as you read this, you just want to say, no, no, not that. <laughs> and so she dresses up like a, like a prostitute. And her objective is to raise up an offspring for her late husband, but through a very unorthodox way. We also need to understand that sheep shearing was a festival. Notice that Judah is going uh, to the sheep shearers. It was a festive time. It was a harvest time, a time celebrating the completion of the wool harvest from hundreds and hundreds of flocks of thousands and thousands of sheep. It was also a time when sexual temptation was intensified by the Canaanite rites that encouraged fornication as some sort of fertility magic. And I, I think you may have noticed that where there is idolatry, immorality is not far behind. As soon as people loose themselves from the worship of the living and the true God, they also lose their morality. That's grounded in loyalty to the Lord. It's a common pattern. And the Scriptures teach us that we are to avoid making provision for the flesh. Judah was doing the wrong thing in the wrong place in the wrong time to the wrong person. And John Calvin comments, Judah is therefore set before us as an example that we may learn how easily the lust of the flesh would break forth unless the Lord should restrain it. And thus, conscious of our infirmity, let us desire from the Lord a spirit of continence and moderation. It's clear that Judah did not have that spirit. And so they begin to negotiate the price. Verse 16, he turned to her and said, come let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it, he said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him, and she arose and went away. Taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. And I think you can see that Tamar wasn't really interested in negotiating the price of the act. She was interested in the pledge that was going to be given. And the price is the goat. The goat's not got the goat with him, so he's got to give her this pledge. The signet, the cord, and the staff. Uh, Derek Kidner makes comment on the pledge. The cord makes it clear that the signet ring was not a ring but a seal probably cylindrical, 
hung around the neck, which was part of the outfit of any man of substance. The staff often carved was equally distinctive of its owner. So these were valuable things that he's going to want to get back for sure. And so the deed is done, and off she goes, and off he goes. She redresses into the attire of her widowhood. And uh, Judah's, at least honest enough, when he gets home to try and send the goat back, you look at verse 20, when Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adolamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was at Anayim at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat and you did not find her. Rather than perpetuating the deed by perpetuating the search, Judah says, okay, let's, let's drop it. But we're told now there's a development, verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. She has been impregnated. She's been pregnant by immorality. Judah said, let her out, bring her out, and let her be burned. What a hypocrite. I mean, <laughs> is that amazing? It's just astounding to me that, that he has this double standard that he can't see his own immorality, but certainly it was shameful for her to become pregnant outside of marriage. Burn her. Put her to death. But uh, Judah is in for a big surprise. Oh, before you light the fire, I am pregnant by the person who gave me these. And she said, we're now at verse 25, please identify those who these are. Do these look familiar to you, Judah? This signet, this ring, this cord, does this look familiar? I would have loved to have seen the look on his face. What is his response? Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I. And so I did not give her to my son, Sheila. And he did not know her again. He did not have sexual intimacy with her again. Neither of their behaviors was right. But she was certainly more determined to continue to line, to continue the line of her husband as it turns out, the line of the tribe of Judah. And the rest of the chapter outlines the birth of twins that she would bear to Judah. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in the womb. When she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out the first, this is important, this is the firstborn. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. He said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name is called Zerah. They didn't want to mess up who was going to be the first out. And it was Perez. And you read this story, and you just shake your head. You think, these are the people of God. How... How is this possible? And what is the point? Some have said that the point is that this chapter is here to show the contrast between Judah and Joseph's righteous behavior, which you will see next week. But I think there are three overarching takeaways from this chapter. First is that God overruled all this nonsense to preserve the line of the promised Messiah. It shows us God's determination to accomplish His purpose. 
So it's not surprising that this story is included here, because you just remember that the story, the biblical narrative from Genesis 37 to 50 is not ultimately the story of Joseph, but as with all the Scriptures, a continuing story of God's covenant faithfulness to bring the Messiah to redeem His people. Chapter 38 is the story of the line of Judah, not Simeon, not Reuben, not Joseph, but Judah. Joseph is to be the means of preserving Israel and his sons, most importantly the tribe of Judah, from whom was to come the Messiah. And it's when you come to chapter 49 that we are told through which of the twelve tribes the promised Messiah would be born. It's in chapter 49 that we find Jacob giving the blessings to his twelve sons. He's on his deathbed, one by one they come. You recall God had promised Abraham that his offspring would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This was passed down to Isaac, not Ishmael, then to Jacob, not Esau, who was the older brother. But then comes the conundrum. Jacob had 12 sons. Which one should be the one to carry on the promise? By rights, it should have been Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn, but he sinned and was passed over. The same is true of Simeon and Levi. But in the order of the blessings, when you come to Judah, the fourth son, we read these amazing words in Genesis 49. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. And what you see in that blessing are some important things, some important promises. First of all, that Judah is going to be the dominant tribe in Israel. Do you remember how upset brothers and parents of Joseph were with the dream about them bowing down to him. Well, here we have the picture of everyone bowing down to Judah. Second, Judah's going to be like a lion in strength and courage. Third, and most significant, I believe, that is the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. The Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute, or Shiloh, comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This is a key part of the prophecy. It's from the tribe of Judah that will come the great King David and the line of kings that would follow. The scepter of authority and rule will travel through that line through Judah until the Messiah appears. Some of your translations might say, until Shiloh appears. In this case, our translators are correct in rendering it until tribute comes to him, or in other words, until he comes to whom it belongs. All this glory, all this authority will appear. This is going to be the worthy one. And this is the one the whole way toward the other end of the Bible in chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus Christ is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which of course has its roots right back in Genesis 49. And so this prophecy, you can see, includes His reign over all the nations. So it's not that He is merely to be preeminent over the people of Israel. He's to be preeminent over the entire world who will give Him obedience. These are the peoples of whom that promise speak. Chapter 8 teaches us how that line of Judah was preserved. So first of all, it teaches us God's determination to accomplish His purpose and to keep His promises. That should be encouragement to each of us today, too, that He is always faithful. He will never fail us nor forsake us, regardless of the situation. Second takeaway, it's a snapshot of the future mercy of God to the nations. 
Remarkably, when you look at the genealogy of Jesus at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, that's Matthew chapter 1, if you look carefully, you see the inclusion of Tamar as the mother of Perez and Zerah. And a few generations later, you see the name of Rahab. Then just a generation later, you see the name of Ruth. And then you have a reference, though not by name, to another woman, the wife of Uriah, which is, of course, Bathsheba. What catches our attention is the inclusion of the women and the ethnic diversity that's included. Ordinarily in genealogies, especially Jewish genealogies, the line is traced through the men. This is stunning that Matthew was particularly focusing on reaching out to Jews to trust in the Messiah, that he was appealing to them, and that he's including the women's names. This should not be overlooked, but identified as the Lord's intention to recognize the remarkable part these women have played in the providence of God to bring us our Messiah. So, the choice of these women, notice Sarah, or Rachel, or Rebecca, they're not there, but Tamar, and Rahab, and Ruth, and the wife of Uriah. Tamar was a Canaanite through whom the line of Judah was preserved. Rahab was a citizen of Jericho, who hid the Israelite spies who came to reconnoiter Jericho, and then together with her family was delivered from the destruction that came to the city. She became the mother of Boaz, who married Ruth. Now, Ruth was a Moabitess who was determined to remain with the people of God after the death of her husband. She became the wife of Boaz as the nearest relative of her deceased husband. That was the law of Leveret marriage at work once again. She became the great-grandmother of King David. And Bathsheba as well was probably a Hittite because she was married to Uriah the Hittite. God's plan from the very beginning was to include this gospel and offer to all people, all who would believe, young, old, male, female, Jew, or Gentile. And isn't that how Matthew's gospel ends? It ends with that great commission to take the gospel to all nations, to make disciples of all nations. What a remarkable story that God has woven. And finally, takeaway is a vivid reminder of God's grace towards sinners. You know, we look at those people and we say, wow, they were really messed up. You know, we're messed up too. Uh, and we can only really understand how messed up we are is if we would see ourselves through God's eyes. But we can be grateful that God is merciful and loving, that He reached down to us through all the, the filth and the muck, and He introduced us to His Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the offspring of Judah. And I think Jim Boyce's quote of Luther's commentary on this is particularly appropriate. The church of God has great need of these examples. For what would become of us? What hope would be left for us if Peter had not denied Christ, and all the apostles had not taken offense at the Lord, and if Aaron, Moses, Aaron, and David had not fallen? Therefore, God wanted to console sinners with these examples and to say, if you've fallen, return. For the, for the door of mercy is open to you. You who are conscious of no sin, do not be presumptuous, but both of you should trust in my grace and mercy. We praise the Lord that He is not a God who puts us to death at our first sin or gives up on us, or that we can foil His plans by our foolishness. But no, He truly is working all things together for good to those who love Him, those who are called according to His purpose, because He is our sovereign God, determined to accomplish the redemption of His people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this truly has been uh, an unusual story, one that jars us with how explicit it is. 
And yet, Lord, we know that we don't sin generally. We sin explicitly and specifically. How we thank you, O Lord, that through all of this you have accomplished your purpose. You have overruled the sinfulness and foolishness of people to accomplish your will. And we pray, O Lord, that you would help us to understand and be humbled by the grace you've extended to each one of us. And Father, we thank you that the Lion of the tribe of Judah will soon appear. He will appear in his glory. He will appear as the one who experiences the fruit of his coming as the Lamb of God. And I pray, O oh Lord, that each one of us each person within the hearing of these words would examine our own hearts and see the foolishness there and realize and understand that it's only through Christ that that foolishness can be addressed, that our sins can be forgiven, that we can receive true wisdom, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in prayer once more. Almighty God, we gather today acknowledging that you are the great, the awesome, the true God to whom all peoples owe worship and praise and honor and glory. However, we understand that we have fallen far short uh, of the glory of God. And so we pray that you would ever help us and strengthen us to walk in ways that are pleasing to you, standing on the foundation of the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh Lord, not to be arrogant uh, toward others, Help us to understand that it's only by your grace that we walk with you. Today, our Lord, we also acknowledge the birthday of our nation. We acknowledge that you are the God of the nations, that nations have come and nations have gone. And Father, we are in great, have grave concern for our nation at this time. We see a nation that is characterized by chaos in many ways. We certainly see a nation that is godless in many ways. And your word says that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, perilous times. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. The Father in heaven, we see all these things all around us. We thank you, Father, for the heritage of faith that traces through our history. But, O oh Lord, we fear that we have come to the place where there is the appearance of godliness, but its power is denied. Father, we pray that you would bring great revival in this land. We know that these things can only be changed when hearts are changed. And only the gospel of Jesus Christ can change hearts. We pray, Lord, for the mitigation of the coronavirus, which is flaring up uh, in so many places in our nation. Pray for wisdom for people, wisdom for us as we interact with others. We also pray for the civil unrest 
We pray that our nation will be a nation characterized by, by justice and righteousness. We pray for wisdom for our leaders as they make decisions, as they try to rule in a way that is appropriate and just and righteous. You've said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Help us to be a nation that fears you, a nation that is not afraid to acknowledge that you are the true and the living God. Help us to stop looking at worldly solutions and to focus on you. For we know it's only through worshiping you in spirit and in truth that we will be able to have knowledge and understanding about the issues of life that are affecting us as a nation and as individuals. And as we close our prayer today, we remember to pray for the Jacobs family. We thank you for Joan, who passed away this week. Pray for your comfort for her three daughters and their families. And uh, pray that they would know your peace. And we thank you, Lord, that as we come to you today, we can come in the words that our Savior, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work with us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. 
Amen.